Thank you, girls. If you don't know that song in, uh, in English, it's Behold Our God, Seated on His Throne, Come Let Us Adore Him, is what it says. And I hope that's why you came tonight, so we can adore our God together in a worship that's real, a worship that's not vain, a worship that's in spirit and in truth. I hope that's why everybody is here tonight. We love you and we're glad that you're here, but I hope you're not here to see us. We will let you down. I hope that you came here tonight to have an encounter with the Lord, to worship the Lord our God, who is seated on his throne. You know, this morning, I, as I was listening to that song just now, Jesus Christ is seated on the throne. Amen. Amen. He is seated on the throne. Okay, we Amen. talked this morning about traditions that make the word of God of none effect, and we talked about uh, an image of another person seated on the throne of God, and how we called that idolatry. I'm not going to re-preach the whole message for you now, but I do want to just in summary, talk a little bit about what we discussed. I want to talk about, uh, you know, the difference. Really, what is the difference between what we believe here and what they believe there and why? figure. He's just some guy who got on a cross. He's just the son of Mary. You know, and that, that I would say is the, uh, is the biggest difference. You know, who, who saves you? Who got on the cross for you? Who rose again the third day? Who intercedes for you before the Father? Whoever leaveth to make intercession for you? There's only one. There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12 says. In his name of Jesus Christ, and we go to him and we receive salvation freely. And that song, my favorite song at Calvary, my favorite verse of any song is verse number two. By God's grace at last my sin I learned. By God's word at last my sin I learned. And then I trembled at the law that I had spurned. And I hope that you have come to that point in your life. Let's, if not, let's just stop right there. Have you read God's word and have you trembled at the law that you've spurned? before a holy and a righteous God whose law you have broken and have you trembled. If you have never come to a point where you have trembled at the law that you have spurned, then you need to stop right now and think about it. You need to stop right now and think about it. By God's word, at last my sin I learned, and then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary, to the cross, to the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, my guilty soul said, God, I'm guilty before you. And nothing can save me except for your finished work on the cross. Amen. And I don't care what name, I don't care how many times they put Christian on the church, I don't care how many times they claim Christianity as, as their birthright or whatever other nonsense they want to say. If you are not imploring the name of Christ and his finished work on the cross, you're not going to heaven. You should tremble at the law that you've spurned because one day you will pay the consequences of that law. One day you will live forever, die forever, live in a living death forever in a place called hell because of the law that you have broken. Unless your guilty soul now in this life, not in some other future, not in some resurrected future, unless you in this life you implore the name of Jesus Christ and say, God, save me. Save me because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. When he hung there, he said, it is finished. There is no other work that needs to be done to pay for my sins. It was finished on the cross. This is not the message tonight. Okay, We'll get to the message. But this is important. You need to think about this. Call on the name of Jesus Christ right now. I don't know when I'll get a chance to stand in front of these people, this group, and say this again. Call on the name of Jesus Christ to be saved right now. If you don't know 100% that you are saved, you need to call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now to save you. There is none other name. There is no other name. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. What is truth, Pontius Pilate said. She said, I am truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. You cannot get there on your good works. You cannot get there because you're nice to people. You cannot get there through being a gentle or a good-natured person. You cannot get there through any saint, through any religion, through any other name other than the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you have not called upon his name, you need to do it now. You need to do it now. You need to call on him before you leave this place. 
And it would be a, a wasted chance if I didn't say that. We can't, I can't go to Sardinia and tell everybody else that. We made a deal, right? We say it here and we say it there. You guys say it here and we say it there. And when I get a chance, I'll say it here. And if you get a chance, you can say it there with us. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Then we'll get to the real message. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read verses 19 through 22. There's one point to tonight's message. It's very simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's stand together as we read. If you're physically able, ask if you'll read these three verses. 19, 20, 21, and 22, four verses. Forgive my math. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 22. The Apostle Paul is writing, and he says this. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I'm going to read that last sentence again. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your scripture that is so clear. Thank you so much for your blood that you shed on Calvary, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for the day that I trembled before that law, Lord. I spent a lifetime trembling before that law and knowing that I was not worthy to go to you, but I didn't know how to get there, Lord. And one day you, through your word, Lord, you showed me the truth, Lord. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray that everyone here will have that moment, if they have not yet, that they will tremble before your law and they will make that decision today. Call on your name, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will, if, if nothing else, Lord, gets through today, Lord, I pray that your gospel will get through. I pray that your son, Jesus Christ, will be high and lifted up, Lord, and I pray that if he is high and lifted up, as you have promised, that he will draw all men unto himself. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. This morning we talked about some ways we might allow tradition to get in the way of what the gospel wants us to do of what Christ commanded us to do. The Lord has commanded us to take his message forward, and you know, we have just gotten really good at excusing ourselves for not doing it. He has given us a command to go and take the gospel and to reach, preach it to every creature. So, you know, he didn't, <laughs> didn't make it very complicated for us. We don't have to decide who to preach it to. He said, hey, how about everybody? If you see him, preach the gospel to him. Make it really, really simple for you guys. You don't got to think about that. I'm not going to make you decide. I'm not going to give you some long criteria. How about you just reach everybody? How about you just share the gospel to everyone? We've seen uh, that we've gotten very good at excusing ourselves for not doing that, even though we call it the Great Commission. We have gotten very good at excusing ourselves for not doing it. And we've even built up unbiblical traditions on top of things that directly impede the goal of world missions, if you think about it. There are traditions we have built up and, and different customs we've built on top of those traditions, and they get in the way of the goal of world missions, which is to go. Anything that gets in the way of going is something that's getting in the way of doing what the Word of God tells us to do. Tonight we're going to look at some very famous, very effective missionaries in New Testament church. And we're going to follow their example in defining the means for planting churches and reaching people biblically. Okay. The Bible tells us how to reach people. Amen. The Bible tells us what our message is. It tells us how to share that message. We're going to look at that tonight and we want to say, hey, how, Brother Chris... What means do you want to use to reach people with Sardinia? Well, let's look at that tonight. But first we do that, I want to ask you a question. So let's have a question. Anybody can open up, anybody can answer. Most brave enough can answer. If I was going to ask you, who are the, in, in history, from the Bible until now, who are the most effective missionaries, church planners in the history of the world from the time the Bible was penned until today? Who are they? Two names. Somebody give me two names. Somebody give me one. Jesus and Paul. Amen. If you got another answer, I... You're welcome to it. I would disagree with you. All right. So I'd say that the Apostle Paul is number two, only behind, and it's a long behind, behind Jesus Christ, the one who left eternal glory to come and save us. All right. And they had did a pretty good job at reaching people. Jesus <laughs> paying the way for us to get saved, giving us the gospel message to preach, and then Paul going out and preaching it. And I'd say if, if I was going to um, wanted to model a ministry after somebody, I would say those would be two good people to model a ministry after. Amen. Amen. The principle we'll be talking about tonight is common to both of them. Common to both the Apostle Paul 
and Christ, and the Apostle Paul obviously learning it from Christ, having seen it in Christ, and putting it into practice because Christ did it. And I believe that it might be one of the very keys that unlocked the effectiveness in all of his missionary journeys. You know, he was effective in a lot of places, not just in one place, but a lot of places. He planted churches all over. Let's read our text tonight one more time, and we'll learn what it is, what that key could be. 1 Corinthians, let's just read the last verse. 1 Corinthians 9, now we'll read it all, we're here. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews became I as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law. And it's important he gives context. He didn't give a disclaimer to anything else. But he gives us an explanation here because you can't just start saying without the law without explaining it. So he says, not being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. When someone has done something especially well, especially a task that is considered very difficult and complicated to do, if someone does a really good job at it, we usually want to know how they did it. We want to ask them, hey, what were your methods? What were the methods that you used? How were you so successful and effective at something that's very complicated to do? You know, as we've been back in town, I spoke to a retired pastor he pastored and he founded and uh, pastored a church for 33 years in Washington, D.C., which I imagine is not an easy place. It's not filled with righteous people, amen, if you disagree, and you think that Washington, D.C. is filled with righteous people, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on that. I don't want to argue about it, okay? But he pastored a church for 33 years in Washington, D.C. He raised children. His son grew up, founded a church somewhere else in the ministry, and is the pastor of that church today, a different church, okay? And so those are two difficult things, starting a church and pastoring it, but also raising children is hard. And he rose a child in the ministry that grew up and wanted to be part of the ministry. I'd say both of those things are hard, but especially together they're hard. Pastor Matt, I ask him for advice on those things all the time. When we get together, we, we ask questions. I ask him questions about two things, planting churches and full-time ministry and raising children in the ministry in a way that they too want to go and serve the Lord in ministry. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we have the greatest missionary other than Christ in the history of the world, probably undisputedly for most people. And if we have a chance here to ask him, hey, Paul, how'd you do it? By what means did you reach the known world with the gospel? By what means, he would say? By all means. By all means. As a Roman, I was as a Roman. I was a Jew to the Jews. I was a Greek to the Greeks. He asked Paul, what are the means you plan to use to reach the lost in your missionary journeys? The answer, by all means. By all means possible, by all means necessary. I want to keep two things in mind tonight. First, I want us to think about what needs to be done to reach the world with the gospel. Locally and across the sea. What needs to be done? And then second, I want us to think about what we're actually willing to do to reach people with the gospel. And I hope we'll be honest about the large gap that often exists between those two things. The first, us knowing what needs to be done to reach people. And the second, what we're willing to do, the cost that we're willing to pay to do it. Let's look back at our text because like all scripture, context is required. You can't just take a phrase, by all means, and apply it haphazardly. Okay? Scripture without context leads to every manner of bad doctrine. Especially when you have a phrase like, without the law. You need to explain that. If you don't know what that means, you might want to really in way left field. Um, so let's just apply it the way that Scripture does. Let's look at the way the Apostle Paul applied it and read verse number 19. Let's see how this applies. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. I would say that by all means includes being a servant. Being a servant. If you want to be a master, don't get into the ministry. Okay? You need to be a servant if you want to get into the ministry. You need to have a servant's heart. If you want to be a master, go be something else. Go, be a, go move to D.C. be a politician. Okay. It's the wrong motive to get into ministry to want to be a master. Be not many masters, the Bible says. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Let this mind be, this is Paul talking about his ministry philosophy from Jesus Christ, who he got it from because it was his ministry philosophy. Okay? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who, being in the form of God, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. By the way, that's the only person who it's not robbery for to be equal with God. You make anybody else equal with God, it's robbery. Amen. 
It's idolatry. It's theft. Anyone else you put on a platform and make them equal to God, it is robbery. It is idolatry. But Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. This is something Paul learned from Christ. Picture Christ watching his disciples' feet, washing his disciples' feet and saying, go and do likewise. Be a servant. Paul says, though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself a servant unto all. You know, as a Roman citizen, Paul had freedom. Paul had a freedom that could not even be dreamed of by people around the world at that time. He had a freedom and a liberty that other people didn't have. And he said, I, though I am free, I make myself a servant. The difference between Paul is that he didn't esteem his own freedom and his own personal liberties as being more valuable than the souls he was trying to reach. That's what gets in our way sometimes, isn't it? Our own personal liberty, our own personal desire, saying, hey, listen, I have Christian liberty. Yes, you do. But is your liberty more important than the souls that you're trying to reach? Amen. As Americans, we value liberty a lot, don't we? It's like the thing we value. I guess now it's inclusiveness. But used to be liberty we valued before uh, more than everything else. And, but uh, hey, listen, we got to put that stuff aside, man. we got to realize that the, the prize that we are ta- chasing, the incorruptible crown, Amen. the crown of life, the soul winner's crown, these, crowns, these prizes, they are more important than our own personal Amen. liberties. By all means includes being a servant. I think it starts by being a servant voluntarily making yourself a servant. It doesn't stop there. Let's continue reading. Verse number, 12, verse number 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Number one, being a servant. By all means means being a servant. And number two, I would say it includes borrowed standards. Borrowed standards. Some of you are looking like, whoa, you, got, you, you just lost me. You just lost me. Okay, I know that particular wording is going to rub some people the wrong way. All right, let me clarify with an example. We have a couple in our church by the name of Ricardo and Gallia. Okay, Ricardo is a Sardinian man. Gallia is from Ukraine. She was saved by a missionary in Ukraine, her and her mother. They have amazing stories, okay? When I go to visit them, I have been doing discipleship with Ricardo for probably more than a year now. Ricardo preached for me twice and filled a pulpit in Sardinia for us while we were here so we could be here. Praise the Lord, Ricardo was growing. And in some small part, due to the discipleship that I'm going and meeting with him every single week at his house. And so it is bearing fruit, right? Well, when I go to Ricardo's house, I don't know if it's a Ukrainian custom. I don't know if it's just their custom or what. But they ask you to take your shoes off at the door before walking in the house. And I do it. Once you walk in the door, there are some, some slippers, some dirty old slippers, next to the door. And they want you to put the slippers on before taking another step in the house. And I do it. I put on the slippers, okay? They have their, uh, their, re- their hygienic reasons for not wanting your stinky feet walking on their floor, okay? I have my own hygienic reasons for not wanting to put on the slippers that everybody else's stinky feet have been in, okay? I could reject and say, hey, listen, I have just as much right to refuse to put these slippers on as you had to ask me to put them on. I could, but you know what I do? I put the slippers on and I walk in. You know why? Because what we have to talk about is way more important than athlete's foot, okay? People have suffered worse things. All right, I know you're all grossed out now. People have suffered worse things for the cause of Christ than itchy feet, okay? We put the slippers on. I never got athlete's foot. I don't want you guys to be distracted by that. It's not in the notes. It was a bad idea to even say it, okay? But uh, listen, we have more important things to talk about than funky feet being on somebody's floor or anything else like that, all right? I borrow them. I put them on. You know, this, this, mess, this point here is not about slippers. It's about standards, okay? So don't get caught up on the slippers. Paul here is talking about intentionally and voluntarily limiting himself, even his own personal liberty, because winning souls is more important to him. So he puts on the standard, and he walks in the house, and he borrows the standard. I say borrowed standards because they're not mine. They're not mine, okay? I won't take them with me when I leave. I'm certainly not adopting them. They're not my standards, but that's okay. I'll put them on when I'm with you to not offend you. And I will walk in, and I'll leave them at the door when I walk out because reaching you is more important to me than my own personal liberty is. And even though I have Christian liberty... Reaching the lost 
is more important, Amen. that I might gain the more. I won't take them with me everywhere I go, but I'll certainly wear them in their presence. I will yield the right of way at that intersection. Okay, I'm not gonna sit there and force my way through even though I have every right to. What could possibly be more important to me than my own personal liberty? What should be more important to you than your own personal liberty? For Paul, it was this incorruptible crown that he sought to win. It was the souls that he sought to save. And you know, really, we do this stuff all the time in our own personal lives. We just don't do it for God. We'll, we'll change the way we look to impress a girl. We'll change the way we look again to impress that girl's father. You know, We'll dress up for a job interview. And we don't care if the boss's uh, idea of what's fashionable or, or correct is different from ours. We put it on. Why? Because we want to put on, make a good impression on that person. We do it all the time, really, except for when it comes to winning Christ, to, to uh, serving Christ and to winning the loss. And we, then we say, hey, you know what? I got to be me. Then we say, I got to be myself. Then, then we say, you should accept me for who I am. And we do it in every other area to serve our own needs and our own desires. We'll change all kinds of things to impress other people, but we won't do it for the cause of Christ. Why is that? To get what we, don't, to get what we want, we'll do it by any means necessary. But when it comes to serving the Lord, we say, I gotta be me. This is who I am. I'm just gonna be myself, and if they don't like it, they just have to get over it. Gotta keep it real, we'll say. Can I just say to you, it's time to grow up. Okay, just grow up. Have some respect for people. Have some respect for other people's standards. Have some respect for the Lord and what you're doing, and, and sacrifice a little bit for what he did, because I think that he sacrificed a little bit for you. Amen. And I promise you, there have been bigger sacrifices made to win a soul than the one that you're being asked to make. Then borrowing that standard for a temporary time, putting it on and leaving it at the door. When you want. Your soul was saved at a much greater cost than, much greater cost than borrowed standards Amen. that you can leave behind. I'm not telling you you have to adopt that standard. I'm not telling you you have to carry it with you everywhere you go. I'm telling you, put on the slippers, leave them at the door on the way out. It's not a big deal. Okay. I promise you there have been bigger sacrifices made in the name of saving souls, namely your soul. In your personal walk with Christ, you absolutely have individual soul liberty, okay? That is a Baptist distinctive, individual soul liberty. That's what the I stands for, individual soul liberty, okay? It's important. You can and should know what you believe is scriptural. You should and live according to your own standards and not someone else's. But listen, when you're in the presence of people who you want to win, you should esteem the incorruptible crown more than the rewards of keeping it real. Put on the slippers. Get to work on the important stuff. Leave the slippers at the door. Guess what? You just served God. You just did the Lord's work. And the prize is worth it. Amen. Let's move on to our next point, verse number 21. To them that are without the law, as without the law, not being without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. These people who saw themselves as under the law in this passage are Jews, okay? An explanation of this part would be profitable for us, I believe. These people who are under the law are under Jewish law. They observed Jewish customs like washing pots and cups like we talked about this morning. They had traditions. They had dietary restrictions. They had washing cups and pots. They had lots of ceremonial things. And Paul said, as I voluntarily limited myself when I was among them so that I could reach them. Okay, he's not talking about living without a state law. He's not talking about living without a federal law. He's not talking about becoming a criminal when you're among criminals and a, and a law-abiding citizen when you're among law-abiding citizens. He's certainly not talking about any kind of moral law and living without moral law. I want to make it absolutely clear here because if you don't understand this, you can leave here and say, well, I'm just by all means trying to win people to the Lord, but that's not what this passage is saying. That would be a reckless application of this passage, you see, because Paul didn't live that way. And Christ didn't live that way. I want to make it absolutely clear that this is no excuse for sinful behavior. I'm not talking about walking lawfully among law-abiding citizens and becoming a criminal when you're among criminals, okay? Paul, in every letter he wrote, made it very clear you ought to walk circumspectly. You ought to walk according to the law. He said in Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, he said. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Hey, how are we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? You say, this is me. Hey, listen, who you are is dead with Christ. Amen. Who you are is not alive anymore. If you want to live, live in Christ. Amen. 
baptized in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, okay? Who you are is no longer who you are. You are have a new identity in Christ, and you ought to live like that. You ought to live with, let this mindset be in you that was also in Christ. We need to clear that up before anyone walks out of here with the wrong idea that we should sin in order to reach sinners. It's preposterous. Sin does not draw people closer to Christ. Amen. Ever. Right. Ever. Sin does not draw people closer to Christ. Amen. Ever. Paul didn't do that, neither did Christ. Hebrews 4.15 talks about the kind of life that Christ lived. He says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. You going out and sinning doesn't save anybody. This speaks of a limiting of liberties, not a license for licentiousness. No one is convicted of righteousness and judgment and temperance by our living in sin. Paul said that I might by all means save some. We see that Christ did this and was without sin unto salvation. He didn't sin so he could save us. He was without sin so that he could save us. And that's what he wants us to be. The Apostle Paul limited himself in areas that was not necessary to do so, and he did not make his brother stumble. That's what this is talking about. That's what Christ did. He limited himself voluntarily and didn't do things that he could have done. Anybody heard the song, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set them free? He could have done all kinds of stuff. He could have got down off that cross he wanted, if he wanted to. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. He limited himself and allowed himself to be humbled and take the form of a man and to die on a cross. And he didn't do what he could have done. He did what he had to do to save us. And that's what he calls us to do. And that's why Paul was effective. Sometimes I think we just get so obsessed with being right. We get so obsessed with getting our own way. I've been there. I like to be right. Anybody else like to be right? I know some of y'all like to be right. Ryan Hatfield's not raising his hand. I have no idea why. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. You need to get right with the Lord and be honest. Uh, you know, we get so obsessed with being right. We think that um, we win that way. We say, why should I have to be the one to change? Why can't they change? Why can't they adapt to me, we feel that if we yield at that intersection that we're losing. But you know, Paul called this winning. Paul didn't say this was losing. He said, this is winning. He said, I do this that I might win some. He didn't feel like he was losing by yielding his liberties to save somebody. He said, that I might win some. He called it winning. He said, that I might gain the more. We see it as losing. Paul saw it as gaining. Paul saw it as winning. By all means, by being a servant, by borrowing standards if you have to, by all means. Hey, listen, not all roads to missionaries or ministries look the same. Some are quite traditional and others are very non-traditional, and that's okay. Don't confuse traditions with doctrine, we said, amen? Paul said, by all means, by praying, by inviting, by exhorting, by giving, by sending, by going yourself, and when you do go, do all the above. Pray, invite, exhort, give, send, go yourself. Paul didn't reach all the lost by some means. He reached some of the lost by all means. I use all the means available that I might by all means save some. You know, there was a time when by all means meant advertising with handbills, and I think it still does. It meant that giving out gospel tracts, by all means meant using gospel tracts. I believe it still does mean that. The temptation might be to think, who's going to listen to preaching on the radio? It used to be that by all means meant putting something out digitally or some kind of audio for people to hear. It used to mean, I think it still means that. By all means. You might think, who's going to get saved listening to the radio? I don't know who, somebody. They meant not everybody. Everybody doesn't get saved by some means. Some get saved by all means. I listened to the radio before I got saved. How many of y'all did? I was searching for something. I was searching for something. You might think, no one gets saved by gospel tracts anymore. It wasn't long ago that I got saved by a gospel tract. I know that I'm on my way to heaven now because somebody left a gospel tract on a door of a house that no one was even living in. Somebody found that gospel tract. My grandmother did. She put it on her, uh, on her kitchen table. I found that, found the church. Christ found me. 
And I'm saved because of a gospel track. On a digital ministry, you might never see the uh, fruits of your efforts, at least on this side of eternity, uh, but that doesn't mean you should abandon that ministry. By all means, use every means available that you might win some. You might have to use the internet. Use it carefully. But use it if that's what it takes. Use it to invite. Use it to put out gospel messages. Use it to reach and minister to your community. Use it to broadcast your services to people who are at home. You might hate the internet. And you know what? I'm right there with you. I hate the internet. You might hate social media. I'm, hey, right there with you. I hate social media. And I hate it the most for watching church services. Okay? But there was a long time, if you read about the men who planted churches all around this country and who reached the lost, they hated uh, preaching on the, on the radio. Because people would sit home and they would listen to it instead of coming to church. They hated it, but they did it. And people got saved. Not every one of them showed up in church, but some of them did. Not everyone who heard it got saved, but some got saved. Yes, then there was the development of the television. People hated the idea of someone sitting at home on their sofa and watching a service. I hate it myself. I hate the idea of someone sitting at home and watching something on a live stream instead of going and being in the house of God. It drives me nuts to think about. Okay, I don't like using it, but I'll use it. Not everyone will get saved that way, but somebody will. Not everyone will step through the, the doors of the church, but okay, I'm not building my kingdom, I'm building Christ. That's what's important. Not everyone got saved, but some did. I remember when I uh, was a new and immature Christian, and I had a problem, even more immature Christian, uh, and I had a problem with a friend day at a church we were having church we were attending. I, I don't think I could really explain why I didn't like the friend day. I just knew I didn't like it. I guess I thought it like wasn't spiritual or something. And I didn't always have a problem with the events that we held, but for some reason I always had a problem with any event that was held by any other church in town, because obviously whatever they did couldn't be spiritual. So I sat back in judgment of all the means that everyone was using to try to reach people. And now I'm embarrassed about that. I'm embarrassed about not supporting more the friend day at my church. I'm embarrassed sitting back on my high horse and acting like I was the more spiritual one because I was not participating in an outreach to invite people, neighbors, friends, and loved ones into church to hear the gospel. And I felt like I was more spiritual by not using the means available to me. I don't think Christ would have had a problem with a friend day. I don't think the Apostle Paul would have objected to people inviting people to hear the word of God preached. Amen. My son, Thomas, where's Thomas? Is he there? Thomas said he wants to be a pastor. Praise the Lord, call him Pastor Thomas. You ask Thomas, what are you going to do when you grow up? He says, I'm going to be a pastor. He says, I'm going to be a pastor that gives out free hamburgers, he says. <laughs> That's his idea. Hey, you know what? By any, by any means necessary, amen? Hey, if that's what it takes to reach some people, I'll give out some free hamburgers. How many of y'all will go to Thomas's church, listen to him preach, and hear, get a free hamburger? Amen. By any means necessary. Become all things to all men that you might save some. Become a voice on the radio. Become a face on the television if you can. Become a video on the internet. I confess to you, I don't like it. But those people need to be reached as well, and some of them will only be reached by that means. For some people, their digital identity is their identity. For some people, their address is their email address. Their name is their screen name. Some people will only be reached that way. I don't like it. But hey, they have a soul, and they have to be reached. And you won't reach everybody in the same way you reach them but if you use every means, you'll, re you'll reach some. We need to use every means available. We need to start looking for doors the Lord has opened that are perhaps a bit non-traditional. I know we hate the sound of that. It's uncomfortable for us, but let's think back on the Sunday morning message and be careful that we don't make the same mistake as the priests do, making the word of God of none effect through our traditions. Okay. The word of God says, by all means, let's not hide behind. We've always done it this way. If you've always done it this way, good. Keep doing it that way. But always doing it that way doesn't mean only doing it that way. You can continue doing it that way and do it some other ways too. Reach more people in different ways. And we should never use sinful means or anything that are spiritually or scripturally compromised. Christ didn't do that, neither did the Apostle Paul. I'm not advocating handing out beer in the church, okay? I'm not saying put a rock band on the stage. I'm not saying do any of those things. Don't compromise with the scriptures. Sin does not draw people to Christ, okay? But just got to understand that these people, they might not live where you live physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, intellectually, philosophically. Okay? They may seem to be living in a different century, and their head may be in a place that you don't understand. 
It may be incredibly uncomfortable for you. It may require you to put on a pair of slippers that aren't yours and then leave them at the door when you leave, literally or metaphorically. It may and will require you to take the form of a servant. It may require you to be despised and rejected, but that's what Christ did to save me, and that's what he did to save you. I'm gonna ask for a little liberty here, okay? but sometime before the foundations of the world, the Bible calls Jesus Christ the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Sometime before the world was laid, the foundations of the world were laid. God the Father and God the Son said, we are going to do whatever it takes to save the lost. We are going to, by all means, save lost mankind, including slaying that lamb that is Jesus Christ. When they considered the cost of that missionary journey, the conversation might have gone something like this. Christ said to the Father, I'll go. I'll go and I'll reach them and I'll save them. The Father might have said, it's going to take someone who will condescend to live among them. And Christ said, I'll go. I'll humble myself and take the form of a servant. It'll mean facing every temptation common to man, yet remaining without sin. And Christ said, I'll face sin and I'll conquer it. It means you'll be despised and rejected. And the very ones you mean to save. And Christ said, then I'll be despised and rejected. But I'll go. It means you'll be spat upon and beaten and you'll be whipped. You'll be mocked. You'll have a crown of thorns pressed into your head. You'll have to die on that cross like a criminal in the midst of criminals. It means you'll have to suffer. You'll have to die. And Christ said, I'll go. I'll be mocked. I'll be humiliated. I'll trade my crown of glory for a crown of thorns. I'll hang on that cross and I'll be numbered with the transgressors. I'll be numbered as a sinner and I'll be humiliated. I'll put aside my robes of glory and I'll put on mortality. I'll suffer and I'll die and I'll go. The father would have said, someone's gonna have to conquer death and rise again victorious over death and hell. And Christ said, I can do that too. I can conquer death and I can rise again victorious. And counting the cost, I have to imagine there was a point where it was considered, you know, Jesus, even after you've gone, even after you've bled and even after you've died, even after death is conquered and sin's price has been paid, after all of that, you know not all of them are gonna get saved. Christ would have said, I know, but some will. Some will get saved, and I'll do it all that I might by all means save some. What are we willing to do? Why should we send a second missionary to Sardinia to work alongside someone we've already sent there? How many more people are going to get saved? Who's going to get saved by the second guy that wasn't saved when the first guy was there? Hey, I don't know who. Not everybody. Somebody will. Amen. By all means that I might save some. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found as fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know, that is the high cost of world missions. And Christ was willing to pay it. Let's look at what needs to be done. Let's look at what we're willing to do, and let's be honest about the difference between those two things. Are we willing to show up and support our local church that sends out and supports missionaries? I hope we're willing to do that. At least that. Are we willing to examine our own fields and scatter away the birds, dig up the rocks, pull up the weeds, and be fruitful? I hope that we are willing to do that. Are we willing to grow in grace, including the grace of giving? Will we go if the Lord tells us? Will we go where the Lord tells us? The most effective missionaries ever to walk the earth, they made themselves servants. They counted the cost, and they said, whatever means necessary, I will become what I must that some might be saved. What are we willing to do? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know as I preach this, Lord, that to be doing more, Lord, help us to do everything it takes, Lord. Help us to esteem that crown of righteousness, Lord. Help us to esteem that soul winner's crown, that incorruptible crown. Help us to see it, Lord, and help us to esteem the chance to win that prize, Lord, greater than any liberty we might have here on this earth, Lord. 
Anything that we might gain here will fade, will rust, be eaten by moths, Lord. Lord, if we win that crown, it'll last forever and we can cast it at your feet. Lord, thank you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, on that missionary journey to become what he had to become, to do what he had to do, and for seeing my soul and saying, by whatever means I must, I will save that soul. Please give us that same mind in us that was also in Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.